Well, welcome to Emerald Hill Skies. My name's Doug, and we're here on the outskirts of Louisville, Kentucky. I'm gonna try to um, see if I can get us lined up here so I can watch what you're watching. Uh, and there it is, yeah. See if we can check that audio and make sure our audio is going. Yeah, looks good. Welcome, uh, William. Uh, glad to have you here. No recent views of Beetlejuice here. Um, and there is Mr. Pid. I guess it's first name Stu. Uh, you're early, <laughs> Stu. Good to, good to have you here. Uh, we use a Rasa 11 here at Emerald Hill Skies. It's out there in a, in a Pier Tech Telestation 2 observatory. And uh, on top of it, we have a little outrigger with a sky view camera so we can stay connected to the sky. Connected to the Rasa is an ASI, a ZWO ASI 2600 MC Pro. And uh, you know, we've got a little bit, uh, that's a live view of the scope from just behind the scope there. We've got a little bit of clouds tonight, just a few. They're kind of hovering over there on the horizon. So let's uh, hope they stay away. Uh, let's go to our live screen here. And uh, let's also go to our, our uh, software that we're using now to try to uh, point the scope and also uh, keep track of our plan and also log our observations. It's called Deep Sky Planner. And uh, what we're going to do is just do a search here based on what Deep Sky Planner uh, guesses would be the best configuration. And it's telling us that we could start actually with um, a, uh, a, a, an NGC 4618. Let's try to go there first. It's Herschel's 178-1. So we're gonna click on that and uh, let's see, try to get our telescope, make sure our telescope is connected. Um, hmm, here we go. Make sure that the tracking is connected. Okay, it looks like that's rolling. So now hopefully we'll be able to slew to this and when we do, we'll let you watch from behind the scope. Um, you know, uh, we observe from here on the outskirts of Louisville and there's quite a bit of light pollution here. I don't know if we uh, have ever, wherever, whether you've been on the channel before, but you can see that glow along the horizon there as our scope tries to hone in on this particular image. You can see that we're looking over toward the west and unfortunately, uh, the northwest is the direction of the worst sky glow. Um, by the way, Vito, good to have you here. Oh my goodness, Vito just did this thing where he pitches in some kind of a, I don't know what that's called. What is that called? Like a, a super chat thing. <laughs> Whatever it is, it says $9.99. Now, I don't know how this works, Vito, but it looks like you've just figured out how to do that. I'm just gonna thank the Lord that you know how to do that and <laughs> try to move on. Uh, we're looking now at a part of the sky uh, that is supposed to be in the direction of this object, uh, this uh, NGC 4618. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to, um, what we call plate solve, and you guys have been on the channel before, you know what that means. It basically takes a picture through the telescope of the part of the sky that it's uh, viewing and then it compares that to a library of pictures. Uh, most importantly, the, the picture of the part of the sky that it should have been viewing based on where we pointed it. And then it uh, compares the two, and if there's any difference, it tries to reconcile that difference. And it says there's quite a bit of difference, uh, seven degrees difference tonight. So we're gonna say yes and hope that it can resolve that. This is our first, uh, object that we've gone to and sometimes in the first few objects there can be a bit of difference and then what it does is it it enters that difference into a pointing model that the mount can then use to try to keep track of the night sky and hopefully our, our other models as we go through the night sky will be better. Now right now we're, we're looking at about a three second exposure uh, and a gain of 400 what we're gonna do now is we're gonna put in the, the title up here and it says it's uh, NGC, uh, NGC 4618. So we're gonna, we're gonna put that title in up here. 
NGC 4618. And by the way, we're also going to put it down here in our title display here, uh, NGC, NGC 4618. And uh, let's uh, switch now to a longer exposure. Let's go to uh, 20 seconds at a gain of 200. And while that's uh, beginning to collect that 20 second exposure, uh, I'll just, uh, Stu, good to have you on board from New Zealand. Uh, welcome, glad to have you. I'll just say that if you are watching, it looks like we have over a dozen people already. If you wouldn't mind, uh, just uh, tell us where you're watching from, that would be great. Now we can see an object there in the middle. Let's do a little bit better uh, color balance here. See if we can get those peaks to line up a little better. Move our mids down and let's bring our blacks down to right about there. And this is kind of more of an art than it is skill, but right around the top of that crest is where you want. Now you can already see there's something there in the middle of the screen. We're gonna zoom in on it. Looks like it is a nebula. Let's go in to about uh, 100%. And It'll keep collecting more and more data on this part of the sky. And while we go that, we, we uh, don't have an offset, I don't believe, uh, Vito. Uh, SharpCap is the imaging software we use, and it's just a straight 20-second uh, exposure, 200 uh, gain. We do have calibration frames tonight, uh, darks and flats. And I did shoot those tonight, as I promised you guys I would. I uh, told you that I would try to get out there and get that done, and I did get sharps and flats uh, taken tonight so that we would have a more of a recent, a recent go of it. Okay, let's see, 4618 is our, our target here, and 4618 is on 185 in Stephen James O'Meara's book, and the book that we use uh, as we're going through this series is, uh, again, by Stephen James O'Meara. It's the Herschel 400 Observing Guide. And all of these objects are being taken from the Herschel 400 list. Uh, NGC 4618 is a barred spiral galaxy in Canis Vanatici. It uh, is a small but moderately bright barred spiral galaxy, and it's moderately diffuse. I guess what that means is kind of uh, difficult to to try to look and see the, the, uh, the shape of it. It's, it's, Steve O'Meara says it's irregular. Uh, with averted vision, you can see it a little better. Uh, the galaxy appears to double. The brightest component is the galaxy's core, which is a bright, irregularly round amorphous patch. And we're starting to see that patch there in the middle, barely. The dimmer part is a strange extension to the south. The extension is most likely a bright arc of starlight lining one of its spiral arms. So there you go. Uh, this is a unique galaxy, 4618, and it's the first time that we have ever, ever tried to observe it. Let's see if we can improve it just a little bit here. We'll bring in a little bit more of the sky glow, and that should help the glow of the galaxy a little bit. And then we'll also pump up our mids a little. Uh, Stu says, uh, click the like button if you like content like this. Daniel, good to have you on board from Brazil. Brampton, good to have you on from your observatory in uh, Ontario. Hector Ude from uh, Monterrey. Uh, is that uh, uh, Ude or Ude? Hector Rocha, uh, mucho gusto conocerle. <coughs> Gracias por venir esta noche. Jeff from Boston, good to have you. Kubota man, Dan, you must uh, drive a Kubota mower or a skid steer or something during the day. Dan from Pennsylvania, uh, home of the AAAP, American Astro, boy, what, remind us what that stands for. John Lebrecht, good to have you from Magdalena. Uh, 4618, yeah, Stu is helping us by describing it, gives it an asymmetric appearance. Ah, uh, yeah, it could be as a result of that gravitational interaction with 4625. Stu, is this 4625 up here kind of interacting with us? Let's bring up a few more mids and see if we can brighten this up a little bit. 
I think what we need more than anything else, a couple of minute, more minutes of time. Uh, looks like our color balance is okay, but we're just, uh, we're just staring at this uh, bar. This is the bar across the middle. Let me use a little bit of our digital zoom now. And you can see this bar across the middle and then this spiral arm way out here. And I bet you, uh, Stu, that 4625, I bet, is this one right here. Tell you what, let's go back to um, Deep Sky Planner and we'll tell it to show the chart. And what that's going to do, hopefully, oh, it says that uh, Deep Sky Planner has a different time. Let's check the time that Deep Sky Planner has. Um, local standard time, 7.06 p.m. Yeah, that's off, isn't it? How can this be? So we'll have to get that sorted out in a minute. In the meantime, let's go over here to Starry Night Pro, and sure enough, it looks like it might have gone in the right constellation. Let's see if it's... Uh, Anywhere near, tell you what, let's just use its manual NGC 4618 and center on that manually. August 30th, 10 p.m. Yeah, Starry Night Pro has the right time. So we're going to have to set our time correctly in our Deep Sky Planner. So there you see uh, the, the picture in our planetarium software, Starry Night Pro Plus. Of this galaxy, it is uh, very diffuse. I mean, this is a an all sky image that they have here. Stu says that um, no, it's not annoying. It's great, Stu. We're we're thankful for your help. It's it's interacting. Yeah, that is 4625 is the one that's up here. So this is another galaxy, 4625, and we think maybe it might have interacted some with 4618 and caused that spiral arm to get out of whack. See how this is the arm that. Steve O'Meara talked about that's a little bit brighter than the rest of the spiral galaxy. We're at about six minutes, and that's about how long we're going in this kind of uh, speed chase that we're doing. We can always come back to this galaxy later, but for right now, let's save it exactly as seen, and then let's go over here and in our deep sky planner, let's uh, open up an observing window here and say, that, um, let's see, make sure we're going to do a new session here. And this new session is August 30th, and we're going to say through August 31st, and make it like 1 a.m. 1 a ish or something. Let's see if we can try that again. 1, hmm, 0, 1, and then we'll tab over and try to get to the A and AM. So this will set up our session. And then down here in the notes we'll say we could make out a brighter portion of the outside of one of the spiral arms, uh, but not a lot of other structure. And uh, we could also see NGC uh, 4625, uh, which might have interacted with this galaxy to throw the uh, spiral arm out of whack. Something like that. We'll save that observation. And from now on, this observation won't show up anymore. How about that? So. Uh, We'll search, and sure enough, it's gone, okay? So uh, let's, uh, let's again save this exactly as seen, and uh, then go to our sequencer and go to next target. In the meantime, I'm just going to look at the flow here. 21 million light years away, a third the diameter of the Milky Way. So pretty small, pretty far. Mike, glad to have you aboard from Georgia. Okay, so back to a live view. We'll back that off to the full full length, um, of a full, full uh, camera. And then we'll also check, before we go any farther, 
let's see if we can make sure we get this um, get this sec on the correct time because I have a feeling something's out of whack here. Uh, let's go to let's see apply local horizon yeah um, viewing time here we go. Says ignore. Select viewing time for ephemera state. Huh. So that's disconcerting. So maybe this is just a a thing where you try to search for objects. Let's do this a different way. I've got a backup plan here. Let's go to. Um, I don't know if we. Have, let's save this just in case we were supposed to save that. And let's go to instead. A list of targets and let's try this as our plan. I didn't really like this as much because it doesn't have all the NGC numbers in there so I didn't like that but let's see if we can make this work. Now if you're on a localize we want to say calculate the time and we want to say now. Okay so that should set the time correctly. Under observed we're saying objects that we've not observed okay I think that's all we need to say and then down here let's say run it and now we're getting ready to go to the next object and again we don't have NGC numbers in this list uh, just to get to a next object that we know let's go to the cocoon galaxy so I think we can go salute to it so if you're wondering uh, why why am I muxing around with this planner? It's that this is so new. We've always used a different approach. And the approach we used was to try to use Starry Night Pro as our uh, planner and our observing uh, logger. And just in the last couple of sessions, we've switched to this goal of using uh, Deep Sky Planner. I kind of like it, but it is a little bit tougher to get to know here, isn't it? So I'll tell you what I'm going to pull this in. Now this object that we're viewing now, we're just going to have to say H198-1. Boy, they don't give us the NGC name there. So maybe Stu will be kind enough to look that up for us. Uh, I'm just going to open up a window real quick and try to look that up myself this time and maybe in the future. This is H198-1. Uh, wiki and let's see if um, how about if I say let's just do this differently let's say Herschel Herschel list Herschel 400 list and I wonder if we go to this and if we search here H198-1 Mm, that's a bad sign. It did not find it. So it does not have it listed that way. That's not a good sign at all, is it? Boy, it does not have them listed by the Herschel numbers. Well, rats, I feel like this is not going to work well either. What do you guys think? What would you recommend? <laughs> Let's go to our, I tell you what, why don't we go to this um, target list that we made for this evening. Is that it? No, that might have been the last time. H, let's see, let's, let's just open up and see what our choices are here. Here we go. Target plan. There we go. Let's try that. It's open already. Is that it? 30. Okay, and let's search according to the best. And It's recommending it's 
So what we had originally said was 3893. What a mess, 3893, okay. Tell you what, let's just go there. So let's slew to that. 3893. And we'll try to follow our plan that we had put in the original, in the original um, plan for tonight which was NGC 3893, it's Herschel 738-2. Let's go there instead, how about that? Okay, so, sorry, we're just getting to know this software. So this is NGC 3893. NGC 3893, and we'll go down to the title here, and we'll say NGC 3893, and it's a, um, a galaxy in Ursa Major. A, a galaxy in Ursa Major. Okay. And then we'll plate solve and hopefully our error won't be as big as it was last time because it will have remembered that correction that it made last time, see? Let me catch back up with you guys. Um, Ernie is on from Buffalo, good to have you. The incognito astronomer, um, you're kind of catching. Okay, so you were giving us that NGC number for the Herschel number. This time we were off only 0.1 degrees. I like that a lot better, just one tenth of a degree. And you see that little squiggle? Well, that was the mount making that correction. So what you saw there was one tenth of a degree correction. Looks like we've got about 19 people with us observing. And remember you guys are observing you're observing with us real time. You're seeing exactly what we're seeing. And we're kind of going through here as we go. I think we're ready to start our imaging now. And this is where, remember, we switched to 20 seconds at um, a gain of 200. And this object, NGC 3893, we should be able to find in Stephen James O'Meara's book. So we'll try to look that up, NGC 3893, NGC 3893, and it is going to be on page 119, so we'll shuffle over to that, and Stephen James O'Meara is a well-known uh, visual observer. He, um, let's see, he, um, he did most of this observing from uh, Hawaii in a very dark sky location, but he was just using a four inch scope. So we have a little edge on Steve O'Meara and our size of our scope, ours is 11 inches, but he has an edge on us because he had a very dark sky. Okay, uh, again, this is uh, 3893. He says, it's a somewhat bright and obvious spiral galaxy. It's a small two arc minutes of extent in the sky, two hundred minutes of angle, uh, uniform in brightness, just three minutes from an eleventh magnitude star. I guess that's the eleventh magnitude star that's down there in the lower left. I bet. I think, or is that the eleventh? Maybe that's the eleventh magnitude star that's right there beside it. At seventy-two power, the galaxy transforms into a larger four arc minute by two minute spindle, with a soft oval core and fainter extensions. We're going to hope to see some of that. No sharp stellar core, just a soft glow. Uh, we're going to hope to see it a little bit mottled. That means uh, kind of speckled. So uh, let's do some color balancing here since this is a different part of the night sky. Again, to get, our, to get our bearings, this is over in the direction of Louisville again, sad, sad to say. It's pretty low on the horizon. This has an altitude of just, oh my goodness, six degrees. How are we even seeing this? It's only six degrees above the horizon. We better hurry up because this is going to disappear behind the trees quickly. Uh, let's bring our blacks over a little bit more. Right around there. And let's bring our mids up a little more and let's zoom in. And right there is that little 11th magnitude star. And you can see a little bit of the spiral arms, but you can see a lot of the sky glow. I wonder if we can pull that sky glow out a little bit and still keep the galaxy in view. Yeah, that's a little bit less. So let's let it stack there for a minute. 
And for just a second, let's talk about uh, what you guys are saying on here. Um, let's see, uh, Marty, good to have you on from Amsterdam. So let's see, Amsterdam, wouldn't that be about what? Five hours farther advanced on the clock face? So if it's 10.30, that means it's 3.30 a.m. there. What in the world are you doing up at 3.30? Good to have you aboard, Marty. Uh, Dane, good to have you on from Minnesota. And Dark Meta, good to have you on as well. Um, you know, I was thinking today about the journey we've been on, and you know we're still on a journey. It seems like we are always trying to improve, but where that started is we actually operated from our truck, and I don't know how to tell you where that is, except it's not too far out there from where the observatory is that you're looking at right now. And we were actually sitting in the truck along a little service road here on our campus of Emerald Hills, about a 60 one acre campus. We'd sit in the truck and we'd run the truck and we'd run a wire outside the truck and just barely long enough to get to the scope. And we observed from inside the truck with our laptops sort of sitting on so top of the console. And I remember it was a Rasa 8 and we had a Skywatcher EQ6R Pro mount. A pretty good setup for, for somebody who knew what they were doing. Very difficult setup for somebody who was just getting started. You know the camera instead of the eyepiece Boy, those were tough days in the beginning. That would have been about December of 2020. Little by little, we began observing more and uh, around about what, maybe May, I think, we went to a Rasa 11 in anticipation of getting this observatory. We went to a Ioptron CEM 70G mount. And we were still setting up and observing along that road, still working out of our truck. Um, the observatory went through a lot of delays. We finally canceled the order for the first observatory that we ordered. It was, we had originally gone with a dome roof kind and those folks were just taking forever. So I won't mention their brand name, so I don't, I'm not accused of gossiping. Then we went with this PureTech and this PureTech observatory is the kind in which the roof rolls off. I wish I had a better view. I took a picture of the roll off roof the other night that's a little bit better view, but I forgot and I haven't actually emailed it yet into my laptop, uh, but maybe I can just show it to you here live on the phone. Uh, and you can at least get the idea. So you see the, the roll off roof there. Um, there you go, you see the roll off roof and the observatory is open in this case and the telescope sitting on top that adjustable height pier and boy we're just so happy to have this now because uh, this is a much better setup okay let's go back to our um, object here we're about five minutes in and let's zoom in some more you can definitely see some of that spiral arm now so let's do a, a little observation here this is NGC 3893 and let's just say um, and it did keep our um, session name. Let's say, uh, wow, we, were, we really picked up a lot of the um, spiral arm structure in just uh, six minutes. Um, we have um, 19 subframes. We could easily see the um, 11th magnitude star close by. Uh, there was a bright star in the spiral arm visible as well. You know, we're just making notes as we go. This is the first time we've observed these objects. Uh, we'll save this as seen. Boy, this is a so much easier workflow, isn't it? Than what we had uh, trying to use Starry Night Pro Let's go to our um, next target sequence now, and instantly we can just look and search for our next target. Uh, now on our list, it was supposed to be uh, NGC 3949. So let's just scroll down and see if that's handy here. There it is. And let's slew to it. And you can see the scope is moving. Again, the observatory is about 200 feet 
out there and on our campus. And I'm inside my office uh, working here out of the bugs. I was out there lining up and doing those darks and flat calibration frames tonight, and boy, I was already getting eaten up. Um, okay, so this did slew to it, and I think we're pretty good. We'll do a quick plate solve just to make sure, but I think we're gonna be pretty close. I think I see a little splotch there right in the middle. This is Ursa Major, and it's again a little galaxy, so we just need to change the name. In this case, it's NGC 3949. So we'll go down here and say NGC 3949. Then we also want to change that name in SharpCap, which is the imaging program we're using, 3949. And this is where it gets the name. We were just three hundredths of a degree off, so very close this time. Let's go up to our sequencer and start imaging. Now, this pointing technology is really fun. Uh, it, it, uh, Deep Sky Planner sends a command to the mount all the way out there 200 feet away, and the mount tries to point exactly where Deep Sky Planner wants it to look. And we were just 3 hundredths of a degree off this time. So very accurate by God's grace. Um, let's see, Stu is saying 3.30 a.m. is the best time to see stars. <laughs> yeah, he's trying to figure out why Marty is up too. Marty, uh, there's a six hour time differential and you're at work. Six hour, you're at work at 3.30 a.m. Man, I'm so sorry. I guess it's because if I remember right, sometimes you do night support for people that are doing, um, people that are doing work here, you're kind of like Rumpelstiltskin. They go to sleep and when, when they wake up, you've got all their work done. So I hope they're very thankful for you because this is bound to not be very fulfilling for your sleep schedule. Uh, you can see a lot of sky glow there. I'm gonna keep dragging that over till we get rid of quite a bit of that sky glow. And we're gonna also zoom in on this as far as we can, but boy, this is a difficult object, especially in our sky glow. This has an altitude of just uh, six degrees above the horizon. How are we even seeing this anyway? Six degrees is so low. I'm surprised that there aren't some trees there. That looks like a fuzzy blotch, doesn't it? All right, let's see what Stephen James O'Meara. Uh, Steve, please help us out here. 39.49. You're at work at 3.30 in the morning. 39.49 is on page 119 as well. 39.49. It's about 50 million light years away, uh, Stu says. It's a member of the M109 group, a group of galaxies located in the constellation Ursa Major that may contain over 50 galaxies, Stu says. Thank you so very much. And Stu, are you saying this is 70,000 light years across? Uh, dark matter says you can't sleep at night. Night is like afternoon. 7 a.m. is when you... <sighs> dark matter, we better pray for you. 39... Why did we not find 39.49? MGC 39.49 on page 119. Oh, here is the bottom. A spiral galaxy in Ursa Major. Very small, very faint. Whew, I feel better. It's only... Um, it's only 1.5 arc minutes wide, and you can only see it with keen, averted vision. It's basically a dim circular glow, very delicate oval glow, the very soft core of light. And that's basically all he says. But uh, Stu says this is 50 million light years away, so we can at least point out that the light that we're seeing here has been traveling through space for 50 million years. Let's put that in context for a second. 50 million years ago, at least by apparent time. I mean, if God created the universe, let's say God created the universe 30 million years ago, he made it look like this light had already been traveling for 20 million years if he created the universe 30 million years ago. If he created the universe a long time before then, then this light has really been traveling for 50 million years. And tonight, those photons 
In other words, those packets of light that are traveling in those waves. So light has a behavior of both packets and waves. It hit the mirror in the back of our Roe Ackerman Schmidt Astrograph Telescope. It bounced up to the front to the, to the imaging uh, sensor of our ZWASI 2600MC Pro. And at that point, when the imaging sensor grabbed it, you see the imaging sensor uh, right here on your screen, that little red camera that's mounted to the front of that glass corrector plate, the top of our uh, uh, Roe Ackerman Schmidt astrograph here, out at the end of that black dew shield at the front of the scope, when this happened, those photons hit that mirror, went to that sensor, and they died. And the only way those photons now have life is because you're seeing them in the form of this galaxy in your screen and observing this with us real time. Now, I said we're not seeing much, but I just want to point something out. Keen-eyed observers, and let's hope that you, you are one of those keen-eyed observers, if you look very, very closely, there is a tiny bit of dark dust lane here that's separating the outside spiral arm. And that's amazing. We can see that after just five minutes. Uh, we just got to say thank you, Lord, for this. Let's go out here to um, the web. So brace your eyes. This is going to be bright light. And again, this is uh, 3949. And let's just say NGC 3949 and see if anybody has a Hubble picture of this. Sure enough, there's a Hubble picture. Boy, it's not very large. I'm going to try to... They don't have it so we can enlarge it much, do they? Can I do this? No. Anyway, whoops. Oh, get out of our way, please. Um, here we go. So that's the galaxy we're looking at, except that's the Hubble view of it. And that little dark dust lane we're seeing is this little dark dust lane right here. So you were seeing real time in this image, that little dark dust lane. Again, here's Hubble, that dark dust lane there, a little bit of bright glow in the core. And look at all those sky forming regions. And you were seeing that real time through 11 inch telescope right here in one of those skies. Kind of fun, huh? I'm always fascinated that we can see something that Hubble saw just not seeing it quite as clearly. <laughs> Hubble's got a little bit of an edge on us. Okay, next target. What's up next? You need a Hubble to see it well, Stu says. <laughs> That's right. Uh, in our list, we had said that we were going to go to 3949, and then we were going to go to 7, 3729. So let's go. Did we do a... We didn't do an observation this yet, did we? Let's do that real quick. We were excited to see a dust lane separating one of the arms of this spiral galaxy after just six minutes of imaging. We confirmed our view with a Hubble view. Wow, amazing. Um, so there you go. And after 39.49, we said we'd go to 37.29. Let's go there next. It's right here. And let's uh, slew to it. Boy, if we don't get up off of this, uh, this is supposed to be at 9 degrees. Well, let's hope that's a little better. Uh, 9 degrees is still way too low to see much of anything. I'm surprised that we aren't seeing trees. But wow. Thankful for the um, 61 acres here at Emerald Hill Skies so we can be able to make out anything here, huh? Okay, so we've uh, slewed over to this uh, patch of the sky and we're doing a, um, a um, plate solve. Again, plate solve is going to line our scope up. We've got about 16 people on live. If you haven't yet told us where you're observing from with us, we'd love to see your observing location. We were about six one-hundredths of a degree off, so not really very much 
you can see the tiny, tiny correction. Maybe you saw that in the image there. Now it's just going to take our mount just a, one or two exposures to settle down. And I don't see much of anything there yet, but we'll go ahead and start our live stacking. Now you might be curious, if you haven't watched the channel much, what is live stacking? What we do, we take a 20 second uh, time exposure and we combine that with another 20 second time exposure and we keep doing that one after another. This is NGC 37, 29, 37, 29, and it's also an Ursa Major. Um, and then we'll also go up here at the top and sharp cut, 37, 29. So this process of live stacking, uh, what this does is it averages the dark spots in our frame and it also averages out the light spots. And by doing that, it essentially improves the image over what you would see if you were looking at this object um, through a, an eyepiece. Now, the thing about your eye is it's very, very dynamic. You can see very faint things with your eye but your eye can't stack images. And that's part of why we can make these out, especially in light polluted skies. Because as we stack these images, the light pollution doesn't stay the same in the sky. It's always tingling and moving. And the light pollution is very dynamic and airy and, and changing, you see. Whereas the pinpoints of stars, they're not. They're basically staying, I mean, they're moving some, uh, just with the atmospheric disturbances, but not as much as the light pollution is moving. So SharpCap, the imaging software we're using, averages out some of the light pollution for us because it says, aha, that pixel where there was a pattern of light last time, has no light this time. So therefore, it wasn't a real star. So we're gonna, we're gonna diminish that view and make it darker. But let's say in the place where it's starting to find this galaxy, 3729, in the place where we're starting to look at this galaxy, um, did we already look at this galaxy, 3729? This looks really familiar, doesn't it? Because there's another star here right beside it. Well, I guess it's just a coincidence that we were just observing a star beside it, right? Because we haven't observed 3729 yet. But anyway, uh, where it finds this patch, this splotch of light, it says, aha, that's an object that my observer wants to see. So it uh, actually amplifies that a little bit in the average. 65 million years away, 60,000 light years across, it forms a pair with 3718. Uh, that's this other object there. Very good, Stu. Thank you for your help. And this again is uh, 3729. 3729 is on page 93 in Steve O'Meara's book. Uh, it's Steve O'Meara wrote, it's small and dim and it's barred. So there's a bar across the middle of this spiral. It lies, it tells where it is. Um, and then he says, it's a small round glow. Yep, that's pretty much what we're seeing. Averted vision, and again, averted vision is where you look away from it to try to see it. You try to see it with a corner of your eye, so to speak, through a live eyepiece. We don't have to do that in electronically assisted astronomy, which is what we're using. Uh, it, it tends to blend with a nearby pairing of stars. Oh, I can see the pair, right? Uh, it can also cause it to look fuzzy and then if you increase the power, it says it's a two arc minute wide circular glow whose light is moderately compact. It almost looks like a star in the center. Yep, you can probably uh, agree that does look like just a little star. Let's go above the optical zoom and go into the digital zoom a little bit 
before. We're just not getting a lot of structure. But you know what? Now maybe we can start seeing the bar is across this way. See how that bar is across. So let's go out to Hubble and see if we can see this. This is um, NGC 3729. NGC 3729. And let's see if This is a Hubble, Hubble view. Boy, there's that bar across the middle. I love the Hubble view. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, I think the Hubble's got one up on us. It's just a tiny bit better than the view we have, isn't it? Look at all these stars being buried here. So that bar across the middle is what we're starting to see in our image right there across the middle. You can see the Hubble image is a little bit twisted around uh, because the Hubble has no up or down. It's just floating out in space. But that bar is going across. Look how it's going across the short, the short view. This is a little bit viewed at about a 45 degree angle. Wow, isn't that fun to be able to see that bar first, exactly what the Hubble was picking out, and then go confirm it in the Hubble. So let's save this exactly as seen, and then let's do this observation, and let's say we could barely make out the bar across the middle. Parentheses confirmed in Hubble. Otherwise, this was extremely faint. 65 million light years, Stu says. No wonder. Stu said it was 65 million light years away. And the 60,000 years light years across. Thank you, Stu, for that help. I think it's fun that we can like observe at the same time here. Okay, let's back off and go back to the full view and go back to our next target. The next target we said we do, all right, uh, was NGC 4490. I'm looking forward to this. NGC 4490. By the way, let's do a search and that'll get rid of those that we've already observed. 4490. Here we go. And let's slew to it. The reason why I'm looking forward to this is because the Cocoon Galaxy has a very unique shape. I hope we can see it. It's only at, at six degrees above the horizon. That's just unreal. These are so low. I can make out a little splotch there in the middle. Let's don't even waste time plate solving because I think I can see it. Let's switch immediately to imaging before it gets any lower. And uh, we will do, uh, once we get that first 20 second image in, we'll do um, a um, color balance. And let me change these titles. Uh, this is NGC. 4490, NGC 4490, and it's in Canis Venetici, also a galaxy, but it's in Canis Venetici, spelled something like that. And now let's go back up and also make this NGC uh, 4490. But this is also known as the Cocoon Galaxy. The Cocoon Galaxy and Canis Venetici. Okay, so I can see it there barely in the middle. Let's do a uh, color balance. And we have to color balance a lot when we're in this much light pollution. And also, we're starting to see trees at the bottom of our image. 
but we'll get over here and try to eliminate as much of that interference as we can. We'll keep a little bit of the sky glow because that is realistic. And now let's zoom in and see how much of this cocoon we can see. So what we're seeing here is a galaxy has a unique shape and then a little object out here. And the reason why they call it the cocoon galaxy is it looks like that a worm just crawled out of it when you actually see a good image of it. So we're gonna, we're gonna hope to see this unfolding with every 20 second image that pops in. And by the way, you can watch a bar graph down here in the lower right. Whenever that bar reaches the end, that's another 20 second image. And sharp cap then averages it with what we're seeing here. And we're gonna try our best to bring this out, but boy. It is truly being impacted by that Louisville light dome. Just to give you an impression, here's what we're viewing through. And look at all that light along the woods there. So not only are we at just 6.1 degrees above the horizon, which is less than a fist, if you hold it out at arm's length, uh, not only are we at 6.1 degrees above, but in addition, we've got that light dome and we're looking right into Louisville. Now we are running a, um, a light pollution filter and it's just the Celestron, I say just, it's a very expensive filter. This filter is like $600. So it's, but I say just because there are filters that are a lot more expensive than this one. But what makes this one unique is that this filter was designed with the Rasa 11 in mind. And you just mount it in the front in a special place that was created for it and put the telescope, you know, the camera back together with it. And from the, thank you very much. Uh, if that was perhaps, I don't know, if that's one of the, is that one of um, uh, Elon Musk's um, Starlink satellites? I don't know who, I don't know whom we have to thank for this beautiful <laughs> satellite that just <laughs> streaked across our, our galaxy. But whoever that is, thank you. Now there is a thing down here under, uh, what is it called? Is it, uh, where is it down here at the bottom? Stacking? Yeah, Sigma clipping. And I don't usually use it. I think you have to start it at the beginning, if I remember right. I don't think it'll have any effect now. Sigma clipping does get rid of, let's see if it does. Oh, it reset, the, <laughs> it reset from scratch. But the advantage is it is going to um, get rid of that satellite trail. <laughs> the disadvantage is we lost our live stacking that we've been stacking. But I, I, this Sigma clipping is kind of handy because I'll tell you what Sigma clipping does. If it encounters a single frame, that has extra pixels in it in a pattern that the other uh, frames didn't have. It averages that frame down exponentially because it, it guesses that that was not a star. You see what I mean? And with Sigma clipping, it essentially eliminates satellite trails by dropping that frame from the livestock. So uh, let's try Sigma clipping here for a while and see how this works, especially since that live stack was getting truly bombed by that satellite trail. Okay, I'll look back over here. Ashley, can you explain what an arc minute is? Google makes it sound complex. Okay, Ashley, thank you, by, by the way, for your question. I'm so glad you asked. If you go outside tonight, and if you have clear skies where you are, and if you hold your arm out straight and make a fist. Okay, so you're gonna make a fist. At the length that your arm is, and at the length that your fist is, that distance is about 10 degrees. And so two of those fists would be 20, 30, 40, 50, and you can count all the way back up. And by the time you get up to the top, what you'll find is that 
you will have counted off about 90 degrees by the time you get up to the very top of the sky, or we call the zenith. You'll, you'll have counted off nine fists, I bet. So each fist is about 10 degrees. Now, divide your fist into a tenth, and you get a one degree slice of the nighttime sky. So when we say that an object is one degree wide, which is very wide for one of these deep sky targets, like Andromeda galaxy wide, incredibly wide, it's one tenth of your fist. Then, take that one tenth of your fist, at arm's length now, mind you, divide that one degree into 180, I'm sorry, 360 parts. Now you've got that degree divided into 360 arc minutes. So again, there are, there are 180 degrees in the part of the sky you can see, which is just half the sky. There are 360 arc minutes in each degree. And when something is five arc minutes wide, that means it's five of those one, five of those 360 degree gradations, minute, five of those 360 arc minute gradations of one degree, which is one tenth of your fist. So these are extremely tiny uh, measurements. And then each arc minute is divided into, did I say 360? I meant 60. So each degree is divided into 60 arc minutes, and each arc minute is divided into 60 arc seconds. Okay, So again, 180 degrees in your night sky, the half that you can see, each degree has 60 minutes of arc. Each minute has 60 seconds of arc. And using this angle, we can describe how big an object looks to us without having to know how far away it is. See, the arc minutes we know. The light years are sometimes just a guess. Hey, look at this uh, beautiful image here that we're starting to see. Uh, this is what Stephen James O'Meara was describing when he said it looks a little bit mottled. And this object here is supposed to be the worm that just crawled out of the uh, cocoon, you see. This is four minutes of, of data. So let's go find 4490 if we can. So we're looking for NGC 4490 and the Cocoon Galaxy, and there's the image. So here is the, there's the part that's the cocoon, and this is the worm that just crawled out. Okay, so memorize what that looks like. Remember there's this little star down here? And then it's kind of got this fuzzy glow around it. And look at all these star-forming blue regions here with all these stars being birthed. A little bit of a bright glow, and then look at this worm crawling out. And that's what we're looking at right here. There's that star that was at the end. Here's the glow in the middle, and there's the worm crawling out. It's fun, isn't it? NGC 4490, we're gonna save that as seen. And then over here, we're going to add the observation and say we were um, already able to uh, visualize the worm crawling out of the cocoon after just four minutes of data integration. Amazing. Um, of course, with the Hubble view, we uh, looked back at our image and understood it even better, making out a tiny star along one of the um, spiral arms. Now, in reality, what has happened is that this nearby mini galaxy is trailing past this spiral galaxy and when it's done so it has the tidal forces have pulled these arms apart and that's what has resulted in this outlandish weird shape here probably maybe it was the bar of the galaxy that's being 
pulled out by this, or maybe this was a little galaxy and it's now merging with this one. What do you guys think? Could this be a little galaxy that's merging? Boy, there are a lot of galaxies in this picture the Hubble made. We have to move on. I know that we're trying to get through 20, our, 20 targets tonight. So that's our seven minutes. Again, we'll save exactly a scene, and then we'll switch back to our next target. Ashley, thank you so very much for your encouragement. Glad it, it's a little easier to understand. Um, 25 million, only 25 million light years away. 24 inch telescope, yeah, just a little bit better than this one. The photo you just showed was from the Mount Limit Observatory. Hubble photo zooms in even more, shows the distortion of the galaxy from the tidal forces. Thank you, Stu. All right, so let's go back out to um, auto. Let's save this observation. And um, now when we search, the cocoon galaxy will be gone. The next galaxy we're going to look at is 4485. 4485. Oh, it looks like it. Oh, right here it is. It's at six. Wow, these are so low on the horizon. It's also at six minutes high. I'm sorry, six degrees high above the horizon. Um, you know, we got out uh, over the last couple days and we shot a, um, we used the telescope to create a, I think I see the object right in the middle here, so. Maybe we don't have to do a plate solve. We'll just go straight to the imaging run. Um, we used the telescope to shoot the horizon. And this did take a while. Uh, but try to picture, you know, imagine with me, if you would, that we're, we're out there in the observatory. So um, if you look closely over against that far wall, you can see a little um, a little thing on that wall that has some, I don't know what you'd call that, styrofoam wrap around it, protective tissue wrap. So that's a monitor. And this is a fold down, little fold down uh, laptop holder. So we can actually work from within the observatory for things like this. So inside the, the observatory, Boy, this looks like the same view that we just had. What is this supposed to be? 4485. 4485. Now I'm curious. Oh my goodness, 4485 is the worm. <laughs> So we don't need a separate picture of the worm. So the galaxy we're just looking at is 4490. 4485 is the worm that crawled out of the cocoon. So I'm just going to make an observation here and say, this is the worm, and I'll put that in quotation marks, that crawled out of the cocoon. Uh, so we're going to say we observed that. Yeah. Little blob at the top, right? Okay, so we're going to stop. There, there's no need to do a new image of that worm. Well, that was a quick one, wasn't it? Uh, the next one was 2787. So um, let's again do a search here. And that updates everything. When we click that search button, it even updates the height. 2787 is at 17 degrees. This is going to be a little bit better, getting a little bit higher now in the sky. 17 degrees. So imagine if you go out in the night sky, you're going to hold, you know, two fists up. This object's going to be almost the top of the second fist. It's still too low for serious astrophotographer. An astrophotographer probably would try to get things above 20 for sure, if not 30. So you can see our telescope now is pitched a little bit up with the weights on the right, that's toward the east, 
and now the scope can swivel up in the sky to the 17 degree mark. Let's do plate solve here just to make sure that we're right on the target because maybe that's the target right there. I can't really see, can't tell for sure, but that might be the target there. But we want to make sure that we've got the target centered so that we know we're looking at the right thing. I need to keep uh, doing our title. This is NGC um, Twenty-seven eighty-seven, right? Twenty-seven eighty-seven, and uh, point two one degrees. So it's a little bit off. Now we should be centered, and this is an Ursa Major, and it's also a galaxy. Uh, a galaxy in Ursa Major. All right, so let's start imaging here. And let's look up and see what Stephen James O'Meara writes about NGC, oh, routes, 2787. NGC 2787, 2787 on page 40, wow, that is a January item and we're already, we're already looking at it, 2787, Steve O'Meara writes, you got to have a dark sky for this, you got to have magnification, um, you can have a hard time finding it because it's so small and dim. Um, don't even waste your time on smaller powers. It's a three arc minute wide diffuse glow. There's very little central condensation. Um, it's got some middle brightness. Light pollution will greatly affect its visibility. And we're looking off in the light polluted skies of Louisville for sure. Now why are we not seeing our, oh it's because we're on our sigma clipping bar. Let's go back to our histogram and let's do a color match in here. Let's bring our black level over to that peak. Put it right around there. Let's bring our mids up as high as we have to. Well, we're going to see it, but it is definitely the way Steve O'Meara described it. First of all, it's very small. That's 100% of our optics. Just a, almost star-like, but you can tell it's different than these other, these other points of light. You can tell it looks different. And then when you zoom in, this is now our um, digital zoom. And what we mean by that is we're actually now zooming in on the pixels and we're not getting as much good out of our optics because the pixels are going to start pixelating in a minute. Like right there, they're going to start pixelating. But you can see that there is this fainter glow around the outside where the spiral arms are. And in the middle, there's this stronger glow where the hub is. Now, is this 2787, that's 29 million light years away? Stu, is that what you're telling us, or was that the last galaxy? We could see a an oblong faint glow in the middle. Interestingly, it looked brighter orange. Orange than the stars around it. 
Maybe that's just an effect of the Louisville light pollution, but it definitely seems to have a little more orange tint. These stars, I don't know if they're in our foreground, so they're not really part of the galaxy, I guess. These are just, they just happen to be in our line of sight. Excuse me. So again, we're looking at uh, 2787. Let's go out here and see if we can find an image of this. NGC 2787. It's a bar lenticular. And there is that orange glow that we're seeing. Uh, isn't that funny? We could see that orange glow in our image before we looked at the Hubble image. But we could see that bright glow in the middle. And then this orangey kind of glow and that orangey glow out here. So memorize that, and here's some of those stars around it that we don't know are foreground or with it. And there is some of that orangey glow. It's fun, isn't it? That's after four minutes. Uh, let's see. Confirmed this with, um, I assume that's Hubble. Yeah, it's Hubble. Confirm this with the um, with the Hubble image. Phoebe, good to have you back. Boy, I don't understand, Michael. Why is the Boate's void called that when I see voids every? when I look at the patterns? That's a good question. It's kind of beyond me tonight. Let's see if we can figure that out, though. This con this uh, target is not in Bolotes. Top Flight, good to have you uh, on from Phoenix. This object's in Ursa Major, but we'll see if we can get to that in a second. All right, so that's uh, 5 minutes and 40 seconds. Let's save this as seen. And let's go on to the next target. And let's go back to the full uh, width of our optical sensor. And it looks like the next object was going to be 2811, but let's do a search to make sure. That was 2787. Oh, 3619 was supposed to be the next. 2787. Twenty-seven, eighty-seven, and thirty-six, nineteen. Is that uh, no eleven degrees above the horizon? So that's good too. Let's go to that. I like to be up at least ten degrees and up. Good, our scope is having to do quite a bit of movement. Um. Astronomers and space geeks are amazing when it comes to making up acronyms, but they choose some strange names for things. Yeah, I agree, Stu. Phoebe, what are we looking at? Well, we're changing targets right now. This target is about to be, it's a galaxy in Ursa Major, 3619. 3619. Here, 3619. Oops, there goes a pair of. Maybe that's an airplane. <laughs> there it goes. Tracking across our sky. <laughs> okay, let's switch to our uh, imaging window. And let's just trust that we're going to be in the right field of view. 3619. While that starts the image, we'll, we'll look this up in... Um... Yes, that's right, Stu. We are playing music in the background. Uh, we can turn it up a little bit if you'd like it to be louder, but 
it looks like, according to our volume meter, it looks like it's okay. Probably it's just, it was in between songs, or it was in a softer portion of a song. 3619. 94, page 94. Stephen O'Meara writes about 3619. Small and very faint spiral galaxy. Um, it's one arc minute wide, so very tiny. It can only be seen in a telescope under a very dark sky with averted vision if you know exactly where to look at 72 power. It's still very faint, requires averted vision, yet with some time and patience, a dim star-like nucleus materializes out of that dim mist of light. Maybe we should have plate solved. Um, let's do a color balance. And let's bring our mids down and our blacks over. Let's um, go up here and do a plate solve only. And what that does, instead of synchronizing our image, we can uh, raise the volume of the music, Ashley, if you think we ought to raise it. Let's raise it up just a little bit, and then somebody else tell us if that's too much. How about that? OK, so we did plate solve. Now let's use deep sky image annotation. And it's right there in the middle, 3619. It's that little point of light. So what deep sky uh, annotation does in SharpCap, it marks the galaxies that, it, that it's aware of so that you know exactly where to look for them. That's nice, isn't it? So let's zoom in now on that galaxy. And it is very small. So this is the definition of one arc minute of extent one arc minute wide. That's what it would be. It just looks like a star, doesn't it? Wow. That's so small. So now we'll go in digitally a little farther and maybe we can detect that it looks a little less star-like, but not much, huh? Dark Meta says, I would leave it. Think it's okay? Boy, it's kind of touchy. I wonder if, no, this doesn't have the shift click. Don, good to have your board. Glad you're there. And Don, you're kind enough to remind everybody here to like, to click the thumbs up on the stream. If you like this kind of content, it helps get it out in other people's channel. Let's go to our um, uh, Starry Night Pro. Don't let the music interrupt your work. Your work's more important. <laughs> Thanks, Ashley. But we don't mind uh, just adjusting the volume of it. Uh, so let's show where we are on Starry Night Pro. Hmm. I don't think it did anything. So we're just going to search for it. NGC. 3619. Hmm. 3619. And let's center on that. Gotta spread the word to people who don't know yet that they love astronomy. Very kind of you, Don. So what we're in now is we're actually in our planetarium software. So this is not a live view of the sky. And we're gonna look and see what it looked like, this red rectangle, simulates the camera angle, the camera field of view. This re red rectangle is approximately what we're seeing. And that enables us to be able to um, have a better idea of what the camera is seeing. So you can see that Starry Night Pro thinks that the camera would see just that. And let's zoom in a little more. Starry Night Pro has no better image than that. That's as good as it gets. 
So now let's go back to our live image and that's what it looks like. I mean, we are seeing exactly what our planetarium software predicted that we would see. It's a little bit more orange than I thought it would be. This is um, 3619, NGC 3619. It's a lenticular galaxy. And look, now you see why it looked a little more orange, because it is more orange. And we were already picking up that star color in our image of it. So I'm going to go over here to our observing software and say um, we were already picking up the natural color of this galaxy in sharp cap before observing, before checking with the image from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Look at that. You can see that bright core. It's just so tiny. And look at the way there's another galaxy uh, that appears in front of this galaxy. Probably just an accident, but maybe related. It's a beautiful picture of it, isn't it? Quite a bit better than ours. That's as good as it gets. Six minutes. That's as good as we're going to be able to do here tonight because we're trying to average around six minutes per object. And then we'll switch to our next target and finish off our this. Let's say this object was just one arc, one minute of arc wide, tiny, faint. All right, our next target is, let me do a search. Um, that was 3619, we're supposed to go to 3613 next. 3613, and it's at almost 11 degrees. Almost 11 degrees. Dark says volume is perfect. Um, we have about two dozen people now observing with us. If you haven't told us the town uh, where you're observing from tonight, that would be great if you don't mind pitching that in. Uh, also, once again, I want to thank uh, Vito. Uh, he's the guy who leads the company where our observatory is from. Uh, it's called PeerTech. And at the beginning of the broadcast, Vito did a, a, like a super chat, whatever donation thing. And I don't know how that works, but apparently there's a button you can press and he gave like a $9.99 kind of donation. This observatory, Vito designed it himself and uh, led the manufacturing of it. And also the pier, and the pier means the, the thing that the telescope mount is anchored to there in the middle. And it, raise, it rises up and that allows us to get our telescope above the wall of the observatory and see these six degree views that otherwise would have been impossible with a normal pier that just is solid. So thank you to Vito and for the great job on the observatory too with the quality roll off roof and the way that uh, it is completely maintenance free aluminum instead of being uh, all wood that would have to be stained and moves around a lot. Uh, gave us a lot of uh, advice during the build and uh, helped us design what size we would need, helped us pick out the pier for the middle, and quite by his experience, guessed exactly right on what pier we should use. We did use an eight inch extension just to make sure we got every bit that we could. And you notice that as we view across the top of the observatory, 
the pier height is exactly where it should be with the height of the scope. And that's thanks only to Vito and for his company, PureTech. Uh, P-I-E-R, uh, PureTech. So just a, a slight thank you out to him, shout out to him. Uh, are we not live stacking? We should be. Uh, let's go to start imaging. And the image that we're doing here is um, 271, I'm sorry, uh, 3613, 3613. And we'll go down and change that in the title as well. Sounds very close to the one we just did. Is it an Ursa Major also? It is. Oh my goodness, and right there on cue. Right, well let's, let's leave it this time and see what the Sigma clipping can do. Now this is asking a lot of the Sigma clipping, but look at that amazing view that we have now of this airplane. Oh my goodness, or maybe it was, I think it's an airplane, and those are the two wing lights. And see the red, the red light is the one that blinks in the tail. So this was a time exposure, so we picked up the blinking of the tail as the airplane was moving across our image. Um, so this is not, can't blame this one on Elon Musk. Musk. That's crazy. Isn't it? We're going to see what Sigma clipping can do with this. Now let's also... Um, So we're trying to find 3613s right here in the middle. At least the airplane didn't fly over the top of 3613, right? It's funny because we were just imaging 3619. There's 3610 and 3625. 3610 is one of our targets, so we, we'll pick this up while we're doing the same frame, huh? Get a little bit smarter here. So let's zoom in now on 3613. So that's 3619 off the side. Had we just been doing this, we had just been doing 3619. So we could have used the same image for that. Look how 3613 appears a little bit larger. Let's do a color balance here. I wonder what Steve O'Meara says about 3613. Jorge de Peru. Bienvenido, Jorge. Gracias por venir, Rotraes. Fee, we glad to have you on board from Alberta. That's right. Some familiar faces and also some new names. Hello, all. Papa Tech! Is that Herschel Flight 3613 the Milky Way? <laughs> That's what it looks like. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. 3613. <laughs> 94. Tiny dim elliptical galaxy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, difficult, but it's easier than 3619. That's 3619 over there by the airplane. Uh, under a dark sky, 3613 is very small. It's approximately one arc minute of extent. Very star like pip of light. Swells ever so slightly with a vertivision. At 72 power, it's a small 1.5 arc minute ellipse of fuzzy light, at the center of which is a brighter, though tiny, elliptical core, which appears mottled with a vertivision. And he says, don't move because you're going to see other objects in this frame. We should have paid attention to him, shouldn't we? 
He's going to tell us what, 3625? Was that something 25? So let's don't skip off this live stack before we go look. So that's four minutes. Look how it's lenticular. It's a little bit irregular, isn't it? It doesn't look like a spiral. It looks kind of like, um, I don't know, a George Jetson space car with the dome light on. Meet George Jetson, Jane, his wife. Boom, 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 boom. Well, the entire month of August was lost here in Florida, but might get a break on Saturday. Cross your fingers. That would be great. Um, muy amable, Jorge. Es un placer conocerle. Phil, what is good, Stu? Oh, good to see familiar faces, Phil. All is good, especially tonight's viewings. How are you? You guys must know each other, Phil and Stu. All right, let's save this as seen. It's been five minutes. Oh, wait. We want to make sure we see the other, you know, I don't think that Sigma clipping dropped very much of that airplane. Um, what was this other galaxy we're going to look at? Wait, let's do a quick uh, observation of 3613. Clearly an elliptical. We called it a space car with the dome light on. And then the other object we were going to look at uh, in the same frame was 3610. Boy. That just looks like a little, what? A little beetle or something. 3610. Here it is. It's a relatively bright elliptical. Um, two arc minutes. Bright circular disk, yes, agreed. Gets gradually, then suddenly very much brighter in the middle to a sharp star-like nucleus. 3610. It did brighten up quite a lot in the center with a bit of a shelf of brightness. So that's 3610. Let's just go out here and say NGC 3610. Boy, what a mess. So there's the bright thing, and then these are just halos around it, it almost looks like. is the Hubble view. Looks like a barred spiral in this view, doesn't it? Boy, isn't the Hubble amazing? Thank you, NASA. 3610. Maybe a barred spiral, but to us, to us, it still resembled a beetle. Some color, red on the bottom, green on the edges. 
looks like. Fascinating. Okay, let's say this is seen. And now let's go back here and search again. Um, where were we a while ago? 3613, right? So now we're going to 2976. NGC 2976. Skipping over Bode? How can this be? Because it's just, I don't know why. If we've not ever observed Bode's galaxy, let's go there, man. Surely we have observed Bo's galaxy. I don't think I'm a big fan of this Sigma Brothers. Phil doing well. Stu, elliptical galaxies are thought to form from collisions with spiral galaxies. NGC 3610 is a relatively young elliptical galaxy which has still not lost its disk yet. Phil, good question, Don. I believe you worked for Spacelys. Papatek, how far in the count? Uh, you know, with these 10 or so, I think we're probably, well, we, we could tell exactly 200. We are at exactly the halfway point right now. I'm glad you asked, Papatek. This is the halfway point. 200 objects observed, 200 objects yet to go. So with Bode, let's do a plate solve. So it took us 12 nights to get to this, but notice we're making a faster clip now in a lot Oh wow, that looks like Bode's. Had I already started stacking? Anyway, I guess we had. Sorry about that. We already had a couple of minutes on that then, I guess. I just lost track. Um, <clears throat> NGC 3034. Bode's galaxy in Ursa Major. over on the crest. A little bit more sky glow than that. And then push up our mid some. Wow, this is beautiful. And look, we have two objects in this view. What's the other object? Anybody know? Um, let's see, this is 3034. Yeah, the speed rounds have helped. We're doing 20 now instead of six. Uh, Don, what was his robot's, robot maid's name? Jane, his wife. Hmm. What was her name? Somebody's gonna remember this or look it up. 3034 is a cigar galaxy, M82. How about that? Rosie, that's it. Thanks. So let's do an observation, start an observation on this 3034. 
This is M82, the Cigar Galaxy. Also on the Messier list. And um, also visible in this frame, M81. Song never mentions the dog's name or the name. Oh, it's a bummer. I'm sure somebody would complain if it were today. Astro, that's a dog. So that's MH2 and that's MA1, otherwise known as NGC 3034 of Bode's Galaxy. Well, I guess you could say that this bodes well for us. <laughs> Boy, this is an exceptionally nice image for the Herschel list, isn't it? Wow, look at all those colors. Whoa, I see oranges here in this middle section, greens along the outside, and then just a, an illumination glow. The little green alien, no idea. So this is NGC 3034. Thirty thirty four um, equals M eighty two on page thirty nine. Gazo, very nice image there, Doug. It's God who made this, Don. I can't take any credit for this. Thirty thirty four is a bright irregular galaxy about two degrees east of a four point five magnitude twenty four Ursi Majoris. Um, it's one of the most sought after objects in the northern heavens. M81 is the more brilliant object of the dynamic duo, but NGC 3034 can be seen in 7 by 50 binoculars. Telescope view is nothing short of splendid. It is uncertain as to why William Herschel cataloged this object since he was careful not to include known Messier objects unless he had a notable reason. Good question. How about that? Uh, beautiful ellipse of mottled light, one that swells to prominence with averted vision. At 72 power, the cigar-shaped galaxy becomes even more prominent and disheveled looking. It's quite the spectacle and deserving of more, much more time. But then Omira says, but it's probably time for you to move on to your next object. Terrific object, isn't it? I can't believe we hadn't observed this before. Surely we had. Um, this galaxy, M82, has an orange core with a green outer arms. Very notable. Never seen one like that, Ashley says. Stu says, in 2014, in studying M82, the scientists, scientists discovered the brightest pulsar yet known, designated as M82X2. Phoebe says, the heavens declare the work of the Lord. Amen, Phoebe. Thank you. Spectacular. I wonder if while we're here, we should just drop out enough to see the two of them. Wow, they kind of look like two eyes looking at us. Don't they? Don't they look like two eyes? So this is M81 over here. Six minutes. We have to move on. But that is beautiful. M81 on the left and M82. Look how you can start to see this outer spiral arm here of M81. But this object is even on the Herschel list. 
Amazing. All right, let's change to next image. And it should be 3084. Now we've got to remember we already went and looked at the one. Oh, it's Galaxy. 3034, sorry. Boy, did I jump ahead. Have we done all those? Search. Uh, for right now, let's just check. So we do another search, and that'll tidy up the, um, the altitudes. Calendar forty, calendar four forty four. It's the very last one on our list. Calendar four forty four. Papatek says, Messier Marathon 2 for one shot. Messier Marathon 2 for one shot. Right, Papatek. You got it. Uh, we got to do next target. And what we're looking at is NGC 7209. Jeez. 7209. And it is a nebula. No, what does OC mean? OC. Open cluster. An open cluster in LAC. Lacertas? Is that the name of it? 7209. 0.53 degrees of water we solved. But there's the open cluster. It's beautiful, isn't it? We don't need to play soft for this. That's beautiful. We'll just rename it 7209, yeah, and do a snapshot of it. And again, this is 72. And it's an open cluster. In LAC, whatever LAC is. La Certa, thank you. La Certa. Okay, so we screenshotted it. It's a nice open cluster, isn't it? Beautiful. The screen is blank. Uh, it probably was for a minute while I was doing a new title, Phoebe. Uh, when I type that title, it goes blank. 
but then it comes back when I hit screen. It's just a, a byproduct of typing the next object. I want to try to find 7209. I couldn't find it just now. 7209. 7209. There it is. 273. 273. It says it's a large and reasonably bright open cluster. Uh, 15 arc minutes of sky. Hook shaped. Yes. Extremely rich in starlight, but not all the stars are cluster members, so the cluster actually looks almost twice as large as it really is. Still, there are nearly 100 cluster members here. At 72 power, there's a lazy zigzagging line of stars running north to south through the cluster's center. A lazy zigzagging, I guess like this, like a lightning bolt. Okay, so I took a picture of that. Let's go back here and say observation. A beautiful open cluster with some zigzag shapes in it. Nice. Well, we're coming up on eight minutes to go. Let's go to this hockey stick. Ah, oh. slowing failed. Hmm, maybe. Forty-six fifty-six. Forty-six fifty-six. Target exceeds the limit. So it's, that's, hockey stick. Oh, it's only one degree above the horizon. Yeah, I didn't move some. So let's don't go to the hockey stick. Um, how about, How about we go up here in the um, sky position and say local horizon model if available. Of course. Why wasn't that already checked? I wonder if we save this and it'll... Well, this is so much better now. It's a much shorter list. Why didn't I already have that local horizon model checked? Um, five minutes. Let's go to Triangulum. It's at 29 degrees. It's on this list. So anyway, I went out to the observatory. I was going to tell you while I go. And I shot a horizon view. I, I carefully slewed the telescope so I could see half the trees in the image and move the telescope away from the trees. And I did that every 10 or 15 degrees all the way around the horizon. So what that does is it creates 
an extremely accurate map of your um, barriers, like trees, and then you can you can import that into Deep Sky Planner, and Deep Sky Planner understands then where your limitations are, and using that, it can calculate what it can go see, and that's what we've just done. So, kind of thankful for that. I'm not sure why I didn't have it turned on. Um, Okay, so we'll play solve here real quick. And we're viewing roughly what? North, north, northeast maybe, something like that. It was about a quarter of a degree off. Thirty-eight hundred ten light years away is that open cluster. Um, thank you, Phoebe, for letting us know about the the dark screen. I think I might see this in the middle. Let's go to next image, and this will be our last image. It's uh, three minutes till twelve. Wow, this has gone much faster tonight. Um, I don't know how many objects we've done, but I guess we can figure this out in a minute by, <clears throat> by going back out to the full 400. Let's do a quick. My guess is we haven't done the full 20 tonight, have we? We're just probably short a little bit. Oh yeah, look at the middle there. Oh my goodness, this is a great object to end on, isn't it? Look how beautiful that is. I can't believe I had him, haven't observed this before. My goodness, that's huge. Look at those arms. This is giant. about that? Is that not amazing or what? That's huge. Look how there are three little pinpoint stars that are either in the middle of this galaxy or there are three stars in between us in the galaxy. But they kind of mark the center, don't they? That little triangle. See that little triangle? Now, interestingly, this is 100%, and we can't get the whole galaxy in by going to 100% uh, zoomed in. We have to back off to about right there. <clears throat> Something like right there. we got to go read what Stephen James Ramirez says about this. This is uh, NGC 50. 598. Boy, I bet this was a visual ice cream sundae for him. NGC 598. It's M33, page 313. So we have seen it as M33 before. Three thirteen. Out of respect for Charles Messier, William Herschel did not include known Messier objects in his catalog. He did, however, make exceptions, and NGC 598 is one of them. Herschel cataloged it to differentiate it from a new nebula he found on September 11th. We now recognize the new nebula as a large hydrogen-2 region in M33. M33, the great triangulum spiral, is visible to the unaided eye in a dark sky. It's a wonderful sight for telescopes of all sizes. It compresses to an oval disk nearly one uh, <clears throat> degree in extent if you're down to 23 power. Spiral structure can be seen 
sweeping away from the galaxy's tight, lens-shaped nuclear region. But it is dim. The galaxy is best appreciated in an eyepiece that provides both low power and wide field. Magnification of 144 power is great for studying the tight inner region, but save that for another night. Wow. NGC 598. What do you guys think of this? This one's called uh, Triangulum Galaxy. NGC 598. No, I don't think the mount is floating because look, zero frames ignored. What you might be seeing are these, those are hot pixels. Photon death, Grendel says. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay, so let's do a quick observation here. This M, is it 33, is that right? The Triangulum <clears throat> Galaxy, Stu says, is the third largest member of the local group of galaxies behind Andromeda and Milky Way, is, according to Stu, the third largest member of our local group behind the Andromeda and the Milky Way. Breathtaking. <laughs> that was me losing my breath. Good night, Papa Tech. Wow. <clears throat> okay, so let's turn off our local and let's go back and search. It looks like we are at 197 yet to observe. And 205 objects found. That's 402. <laughs> so we have 197 to go. That is the count. That's the official count. 197 objects to go. Well, this is the one we're going to end on, folks. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. If you like content like this, we would encourage you to subscribe. Also, if you don't mind clicking thumbs up, it doesn't cost you anything, but it helps get the channel up in the views of others. Uh, we do live streams like this on just about any night that's clear that we can, and that ends up being a lot of times only one night per week. Some nights we do more, uh, two nights a week or whatever. Uh, and uh, we're always live streaming from here on the outskirts of Louisville, Kentucky. Thanks for being a part of this. When you view the object with us, uh, you are actually observing real time with us. You're seeing exactly what we see, and we're thankful that you were a part of this. Thanks also to God for making all these great objects like the Triangulum Galaxy that we can enjoy uh, like we did tonight. And thanks to him for uh, being able to make these visual treats for us. God bless you. Have a great night, and we hope to see you again on another live stream. Take care, and good night.